Well, hi, uh, welcome to Analyze This. This is Matt Barrett, Scholastic Coordinator at the Chess Club, uh, and I'm subbing for Yasser today. Um, uh, I'd like to go over a few games. I think there's at least one game in the audience, and then a couple of my own. Um, I'm going to start with a game I played at the National Open in 2012. This was against Joshua Shang. Um, he's actually he's actually pretty good now, uh, but um, at this time he was 2100. Um, so um, at this time I actually had a repertoire, and uh, my first move was e4, and I had already planned if I met the Sicilian that I would play one of the bishop b5 lines. Um, and so knight f3, d6, um, I really didn't have to make any decision here. This was the move that I had set. There are actually three choices he could make here, um, knight c6, knight bd7, or bishop d7. He chose the most challenging of the three, bishop d7. That puts this question immediately uh, to my bishop. Um, uh, shall I defend it or shall I exchange? I chose the most popular option to exchange and he chose the most popular to take back with queen. Um, this is a good way for black to fight for equality right off the bat. Uh, so I castled, um, although there were, some, there were some other choices here. I had to ask myself whether I wanted to open the game immediately with a move like d4. Uh, did I want to play something a little bit more passive, uh, pawn to d3, uh, supporting e4, um, and going for a kind of a long-term positional play. I really was looking, especially against a higher rated player, for some activity. And as a result, um, I chose this uh, castling move. Um, uh, had I chosen d4, um, I had looked at the line c takes, queen takes, knight c6, queen d3. Those moves are actually played in some other um, top games. And actually, in this time, I, I really was in good tournament shape. Uh, so I remember having prepped for this. And this was an option. It just wasn't something I was uh, fully comfortable with. I was looking at the games of, of Vladimir Baklan, a uh, Ukrainian grandmaster, and um, this was not how he liked to play it. Um, so um, alternatively, um, what, other, what other considerations were there? Do I want to break up the center with a move like e5, um, where after take, take, uh, and queen e6, I can play queen e2, um, and if knight c6, knight takes, queen takes, this looks like a kind of a boring game. So um, with that in mind, um, I, I didn't want to trade things too quickly, um, and, uh, and I did go for that castle. Okay. Now black may play g6, he may play knight f6, he may play knight c6. Um, he played knight f6, uh, which is not actually the most popular. Most popular is knight c6. Uh, so I responded with knight c3. Um, I could have played rook e1 um, and still am holding back on that d4 move because I want to be sure that's what I'm going to play as opposed to d3. Um, knight c6, okay. Had the knight not come out, I think I may have played d3. But with the knight out like that, um, I think my decision was made up for me. There's no light squared bishop. So uh, d4 takes, takes, e6. Um, if he takes with knight, that's actually going to be a little bit better for me. There's nobody to evict my queen uh, from the d4 square. Uh, so one possibility would have been knight takes, knight, uh, queen takes, and I would have felt like I was in the driver's seat there. Um, so e6, and I can choose between um, e3, uh, uh, bishop e3, um, f3, uh, or maybe bishop to g5. Now I had looked at bishop g5 with a computer and it seemed like that wasn't, um, wasn't really leading to any kind of advantage for white. Um, not, that, not that I necessarily was looking for an advantage. Sometimes I like to trade pieces and go to, go to an end game. Um, so here, uh, with the idea of keeping my queen on the board, probably uh, was thinking in terms of bishop e3. Um, and that's, that's, that's how I, I decided on that move. Bishop e7, and now um, trying to figure out, am I going to pressure d6? Um, which side of the board is he going to castle on? Clearly the king side. If he castles queen side, um, I've got a lot of pressure. My bishop at e3, 
two knights ready to go into b5. Um, so one question is whether I want to trade knights um, or whether I want to put the d4 knight at b5. Um, is that going to do anything? Let's see. a6, um, and, and I'm not getting anywhere. So can I play queen d2, followed by rook at a to d1, uh, something of that nature? Um, these are things I'm, I'm asking myself. Uh, but I realized that I want to play the move f4. What I didn't realize was that I should have played it immediately. Um, and so I thought maybe it would be a good idea to put my king in a slightly safer place before I did it. Um, I think this turns out to have been a poor choice. Um, but, uh, but that's what I, what I started thinking. Uh, so first, um, rather than queen d2, I play queen e2. Um, he castles. And I play rook at a uh, to d1. Uh, so I'm still kind of thinking, you know, I'm going to play king h1, I'm going to play f4. Uh, but before I did it, I wanted to make sure that it wasn't my queen um, who was going to be subject to pressure down the d-file when he plays his eventual d5. Um, he plays a6, kind of slow. Uh, and this is where um, I should have played f4, rook a d8. This is definitely better uh, for me. Um, one possible move would have been g4. Right? I'm really throwing caution to the wind. This isn't the way I, I necessarily wanted to play, but this is what Houdini later recommended. Uh, instead, I played king h1, and he plays b5. So he's got some counterplay on the queen side. Um, how soon um, am I going to have to defend over there? Uh, not quite clear. Um, I play a3, and I think that wasn't my best choice. Um, he plays queen b7, a kind of a strange move. Um, I'm looking for some clarity in the center of the board. I know d5 is coming. Um, I'd like to play e5, uh, but of course I can't do it right now. His queen at b7, okay, one possible explanation is that it's kind of eyeing my king on that diagonal. So no longer do I have options like g4 down the line. So those are things I should be thinking about. Um, is it too late for me to play f4, for example? Um, well, I decided that it was. Um, that I'd rather put both rooks in the center and try to open things either on the e-file or the d-file, depending on where his rooks go. Um, <clears throat> no, I didn't. OK. Uh, first, I played f4, um, which um, I think uh, I must have realized at this point that I was going to play, uh, that I wasn't going to be able to play g4. Uh, so after rook at a to c8, um, I retreated. Um, knight to b3. Um, two things in mind. One, he's probably going to be playing b4 um, before long. Um, I'm starting to look at the bishop on e7. I wonder if I can play one of these thematic knight d5 moves. And um, so, I, so this is where, let's see, rook at, a, uh, rook at f to d8. Um, I retreat my bishop, um, eyeing that bishop at e7. So my queen is now starting to do a little bit more. Uh, bishop uh, pawn to a5, and rook at f to e1. So I'm kind of tr trying to play a kind of a, a confused game. Because um, on the one hand, I want to attack. Uh, but my calculating ability is probably not good enough for me to see how far ahead I can do this. Can I play knight d5 immediately is one question. Uh, that I ask myself. If he plays b4, um, can I play knight d5? Uh, pawn takes, knight takes, rook takes, knight uh, at d5. Uh, if he plays b4 and I play pawn takes and he plays pawn takes, can I play knight d5? So um, this is what I'm looking at. And it's actually confirmed later by the computer. I can play this. Um, but I probably should have played something um, more reasonable here. Knight a4 would have been a possibility. Pawn takes pawn was a possibility. Um, but I played knight d5. I, w I was going for it. Um, I was playing a higher rated player, and I, I thought this would be a good way to mix things up. Um, of course, he doesn't, uh, doesn't want to take it. Um, so uh, Two options here include a4 and b takes a3. I think he, he should have played b takes a3. Um, he actually played uh, a4. Um, and now knight takes bishop, queen takes. 
and knight d4. Now the reason I'm bringing the knight to d4 is to trade some pieces off and concentrate on his queen side. He's got a pawn at a4, a pawn at b4, and I think I can take both of those off and be left with either a c pawn or an a pawn. When he captures and I capture, he captures and I capture, he probably misjudged this situation. He's looking from his perspective at the possibility of capitalizing on this weak pawn at a3. So he sees that his queen at e7 is eyeing that through the pawn at d6. Um, I think this helps explain why he plays um, the move d5. Uh, Houdini had recommended queen c7, which shows a little bit more restraint, pressures my c2 pawn, and possibly brings into play um, ideas of a piece on c3. Uh, for example, let's see, uh, for example, after queen c7, rook takes a4, queen takes, rook takes. Um, now I have a passed pawn. I thought this would be better for me. I really did. Um, uh, but uh, the computer says that this is really pretty equal. Um, so five pawns against five pawns. I have a bishop. Um, actually, Julie in this room reminds me of our game in a sense, right? Because I, I would have thought that a passed a pawn was a good thing. Um, and it turns out it, uh, sometimes it can be blockaded. Uh, so uh, instead, um, another option would have been e5, where f takes, d takes, and now rook takes a4 can be answered with this interesting move, rook c3. Um, he, he's attacking two pawns at once. Uh, but most of his attention is going to the a3 pawn. Uh, once that pawn comes off the board, the c pawn is much less dangerous because the black king's a lot closer to it. Um, so with that in mind, um, I was pretty happy that he played d5. Um, this move can't be right. Uh, after captures, knight captures, um, I have this move f5. Um, so this is where the game got exciting. Um, Josh doesn't have uh, much time. Um, he's looking at my weak a3 pawn and asking himself whether he can capture it um, without suffering any ramifications. Notice that if um, queen takes a3, f takes e6, uh, he can't take back with his f pawn. Um, and if he retreats his queen to e7, um, I still have uh, some interesting ideas there. Um, his knight at d5 would now be under additional pressure. The e6 pawn is, is what's defending it. Meanwhile, his a pawn is going to be pretty easy for me to pick up if I need to. Um, so not necessarily uh, thinking in concrete lines, just looking at the threats. f takes e6 uh, looks like something he should be thinking about. Um, and fortunately for me, he plays queen takes a3. And without any hesitation, I played f takes e6. And he, he thought for a long time on this move. Um, I think queen e7 would have been uh, the best choice. Um, he played knight f6. Um, so uh, probably winning here in several lines, um, I chose pawn takes. Um, and after check, queen check, king f8. Uh, and I'm starting to look at um, ways of simplifying um, and getting my bishop in. Um, noticing that the bishop on c5, for example, would be attacking both the queen and the king. Uh, so are there ways of setting up some tricky position of that type? First of all, I decided by lifting the rook um, that I can either uh, double, or maybe I can get the queen to go to an awkward square. And queen c5 couldn't have been his best move. Um, the bishop at g1 is looking at the queen through the two rooks. So the question is now uh, uh, which rook uh, to move and where. Um, if I move the rook on e3, uh, my rook at d5 seems to be hanging. Um, question in the audience. Could I play rook takes d8 here after this? Takes play rook d3. Can you protect your rook from the queen? Play bishop c5 check. 
let's see. So the question is, can I play rook takes d8? And if rook takes, then rook d3, uh, attacking queen and threatening rook d8. And I think if we actually put this computer in the engine, um, if, if we put this position in the engine, we will see that it's, it's winning regardless. Uh, but um, that seems like one uh, workable line. I just don't see any way that he's, he's getting out of this here. Um, what I actually played was this move, which I thought was very cute. I figured uh, the queen doesn't want to take the rook at d4. Um, and once again, it's going to have to move. My rook is better on e5 than he was in his original spot of e1. And I still have the option of playing rook d8 uh, later. So now after queen c7, I found a move again that I thought was pretty uh, cute, rook c5. Um, so in this position, if uh, queen takes c5, uh, now rook takes rook, uh, rook takes, and queen falls. Uh, but um, I decided against that move. Um, and it's difficult for me to explain how I could have seen that something accomplished a goal and not followed through on it. Um, I played rook takes a4. Um, I guess because I also knew that the rook can come to a7. And, and, and already, um, uh, things are pretty simple. Um, bishop check, queen takes. And now he resigns. Um, because rook can't, uh, well, it can take a queen. But I'm up, um, I'm up a rook. And in fact, I have, after uh, rook takes e6, rook takes c8, uh, followed by rook a7. Uh, um, I have um, a pretty clear win of the g pawn. I'm going to defend against a back row mate with something like h3, and then uh, double the rooks on the um, seventh rank. Uh, so yeah, that was an exciting game uh, for me in 2012, uh, right before I started working at the chess club and Scholastic Center. Uh, and since then, um, have been focusing more on Scholastic chess. Um, uh, but um, yeah, fun to play tournament chess from time to time. Um, now, the next game I'd like to look at uh, is a game by one of our members. Uh, that's uh, Julian Perleko. Uh This game was played between um, an expert uh, playing the white pieces and Julian Perleko, um, another expert, playing the black pieces. Uh, but we're for Julian because he's from St. Louis. Um, and uh, so the game begins. E4, C5, Knight F3, E6. So in the last game we saw D6, Bishop B5. Um, and here, E6, Knight C3. So white holding back on the D3, D4 option. We're not quite sure how the structure is going to develop. Knight C6. OK, now this looks familiar um, from some of these games that I mentioned by Vladimir Baklan. Um, who likes to play Roy Lopez when his opponent plays e5. And he likes to play these bishop b5 Sicilians uh, when his opponent plays Sicilian. So here, bishop b5 makes a lot of sense uh, to me. Um, one question is whether black is willing to double the pawns on c6, or if um, he's going to first play a knight to e7, such that he could replace that knight at c6. So first he plays knight at g to e7. Uh, castles, and now a6. So I like the way Julian's playing so far. He didn't want to compromise his pawn structure, and he still has time to chase the bishop at b5. It doesn't have a retreat square on f1. Had white played a little bit faster and played bishop b5 on move 3 without that knight c3 interposed, he might have had time to play castle rook e1 and then bring the bishop all the way back to f1. But here, he has to take. Uh, knight takes, and d3. Bishop e7, bishop e3, castles. Now, here's an interesting move. Uh, we've come to like a first sort of key strategic middle game decision. Um, by bringing the knight to e2, white's obviously thinking in terms of coming to f4 or going to g3. Um, is there going to be some kind of um, uh, attacking possibility on the king side. Um, 
Julian probably isn't concerned here, he may play some immediate d5. He can play b6 and bishop b7. He might even play b5. Uh, but first, um, Julian, an attacking player, wants to take control of things in the center, d5. Um, e takes d5, e takes d5. Uh, so now white goes ahead and closes up that center of the board. Probably a good choice because black may have been threatening. Were you thinking this, Julian? D4? Yeah, I was thinking about D4. Also, I just would make bishop D4 and knight E5. Because he doesn't play D4. Right. So, so let's say he plays something else like uh, rook E1. Um, would you like to play bishop G4 or D4? Yeah. Yeah, I like d4. And then let's say the bishop goes to somewhere like f4, now bishop g4. Um, and um, how will he continue? He doesn't want to ruin his pawn structure on um, the king side. So he's either going to play something like knight g3, or could he play knight e5? Um, the bishop might start to get loose if the e2 knight is pinned or um, if, um, if it's removed. Um, so I'm not sure. Yeah, bishop g4 definitely looks like something that he should recognize the potential of as well. He, so he plays d4, stopping uh, the move d4 himself. And now this interesting move, c4. Um, so Julian, you've described this game as a, um, a sort of positional mindset. Um, where usually you play these very attacking games. Uh, so here you're thinking expand on the queen side? Good, okay. Right, so by locking these pawns on light squares, it makes that dark squared bishop of whites at e3 a little bit less effective. Um, and uh, meanwhile, black has two bishops to play with. So certainly uh, looking pretty good. Now sometimes we'll frown on releasing the tension. Um, um, I've certainly heard people like Gregory Kaidanov talking about maintain the tension. Um, but in this position, maybe the pawn coming to c4 also has an effect on the minor pieces of white. Um, and so that's, that's a very interesting choice. White plays c3. And now the bishop activates on the colored squares um, that its pawns have taken up, the light square. So bishop f5 with some possible later threat of bishop d3. Um, uh, that c4 pawn um, isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, knight g3, bishop g6. Uh, you, I guess you could have played bishop d3 straight away. But I thought you wanted to play rook e1 anyway, so I didn't want to encourage that. OK. Yeah, certainly. OK, so this kind of gives white a chance, balls in his court. What's his next idea? Um, and uh, that's an interesting way to play. And I also associate it with a kind of a positional uh, technique um, that we, we put the ball in the court of the other player and allow them to make some key strategic decision. As long as we're able to play flexibly, uh, we may be able um, to take advantage of uh, what decisions they make. Uh, so here, rook e1, right? We didn't bother provoking it in the first place. Queen c7, queen d2. OK, so white's beginning to pile up with ideas of moving in on the king side. Could knight e5 uh, be in the cards? Uh, could bishop f4 come first, followed by knight e5? Those are the types of things that, that cross my mind. Um, probably what queen d2 indicates is that bishop f4 is coming next. Um, but black can answer bishop d6. Yeah, it doesn't look like too much of a problem. Here comes bishop d6, knight h4. OK, so white's willing to invest an extra move to try to trade off that bishop pair. And now black has to decide, do I want to concede my bishop pair, or can I put my bishop on the square that um, looks so appetizing there, d3. Uh, so uh, Julian chose bishop d3. And now some knight or other is eyeing f5. Um, it must be the h4 knight. Uh, we didn't want to give up the pawn at h2. 
So yes, it's possible to trade that night, but more likely, and I think uh, Julian chose here to play bishop takes g3. Um, and now white can either compromise his pawn structure or he can retreat um, his only good minor piece. Uh, and that's what uh, he does. Oh, he couldn't have compromised the pawn structure because he would have lost his knight. <laughs> so, OK, so now b5, uh, logical move. And it looks like a5 and b4 uh, could be coming. And I think this is one of the reasons, Julian, that, that you enjoyed this game so much, right? You've got that space, and there's really not much that he can do to stop you. Um, is he going to have to play some ridiculous looking move like a3 and make a, a big hole that your knight can come in a5 to b3 um, or, um, or what? He really was missing his light squared bishop here, I think. Um, and also, doesn't it have to cross his mind to play some move like b3? Um, shouldn't he have maybe even played it as soon as you played c4? Uh, yeah, so knight e2 is a little bit late in coming in and trying to, to um, mix things up here. I guess he's considering knight f4 or knight c1 with the idea of, of kicking that bishop from d3. Uh, interesting strategic choice. So what, what good was your bishop as an attacking piece? His pawns are on dark squares, right? Yeah. What, what else were you thinking? Yeah, there was no good way to stop knight f4, and clearly that was what he was up to. Uh, his knight turns out to be a more maneuverable piece in this, in this position, or at least based on where it was at g3 there. It had some, some latent attacking possibilities. It wanted to come into f5 or h5. It wanted to go um, eventually perhaps to f4 and kick the bishop. Um, now that we've exchanged uh, one pair of knights, um, getting that knight off the board makes this an interesting bishop versus knight um, end game. And uh, certainly because of the structure of the pawns on the queen side, I'd favor the knight there, I think. Uh, rook takes. So now probably, unless we want to put a rook on the e file, we can put a rook on the b file and play a4, uh, a5 and b4. Um, okay, a5. Rook at a to e1, rook at f to e8. So when the bishop moves, no fear because all of the rooks can come off the board with some move like queen d7. Uh, I like trading, especially when I've got this much space. Well, I should, I should concede, too, that I'm not substituting this class for Yasser because I have any kind of analytical ability that, that rivals Yasser. Um, instead, um, I'm subbing this class uh, simply um, because I was available. Um, I think the fact that, that I want to trade pieces in a position, uh, uh, if I were playing the black pieces here, for example, uh, uh, where I have an advantage is probably bad. In my lessons with, uh, with uh, Ben Feingold, he always tells me not to trade when I have the advantage. Um, so uh, maybe, maybe some of the title players would be suggesting here keeping all those rooks on the board. Uh, but um, let's see what happens next. Bishop f4, we're not going to have a choice. We have to play something like queen d7. And now it was white's option to take the rooks off, and he chooses to play bishop g3. So maybe he understands strategy better than I do. I think if I was the white player, even here, rather than bishop g3, I would go ahead and play rook takes rook, and after uh, rook takes, then rook takes e8, queen takes e8. Um, and, uh, and I'd be willing to play that end game. Um, yes, black's going to get uh, some pressure on the e file. He may be able to play a move like queen e4 later on and have some light squared entry points uh, either at d3 or at b1. Um, so those are things to worry about. Um, bishop g3 instead. Uh, so now it's Julian's choice. Uh, if he really wants those rooks off, he can make it happen. f6. 
queen f4. Okay, so I guess perhaps white is thinking that by getting his queen to c7, um, or if the black queen comes off of the seventh rank, he'll be able to put some pressure down there. Uh, not clear to me that queen f4 uh, really changes things much. Rook takes, rook takes e2, rook e8. Uh, White doesn't have a lot of options here. He can play rook e3. He can play rook takes e8. Um, but uh, things are definitely going to clarify quickly. King f1, rook takes e2, king takes e2. Um, so now we want to ask ourselves um, whether white has any way to get in on the queen side. Um, as long as the queen is at d7 and the knight is at c6, um, he doesn't appear to. He probably doesn't want to trade queens because surely the knight is going to be more effective in this end game than the bishop. Um, and in addition, I think Julian probably wants to keep his queen on the board. Queen and knight is a very powerful combination of pieces. Uh, queen e6, queen e3, king f7. So again, white could take, but it seems like that's not the best option. King d2. And now maybe a move like queen f5, and there's that access on the light squares that we were talking about. There it is. Yeah, this just doesn't look, now he's done, I think strategically. Uh, there's no way, so he plays king c1 because he needs to stop the entry on b1, and it was the only way to do it. Uh, and now I think we just push on the queen side, b4. OK, is there anything white can do? Does a move like bishop d6 help at all? Um, your knight is probably not going anywhere. Um, queen f4, OK, so he repeats. But queen d3 looks like a possibility, and queen f1, and yeah. So, so just a quick calculation here, queen c7, knight e7, Bishop d6, um, lots of checks and pawn captures, and white is toast. Is that pretty much accurate? Yeah, certainly when we talk um, in, in our scholastic classes about how uh, kids should think at the chessboard, uh, want to threaten things like checkmate, check, um, threaten major pieces like queens. In this position, pawn to b3. Um, is a great move. It threatens two significant things, one of which is checkmate, and the other of which is to queen a pawn on the A file if you haven't captured. So if b3 comes, uh, even if white plays a takes b3, there's another pawn to replace it, c takes b3. And now checkmate's being threatened at c2. Um, uh, it, it looks like lights out. Uh, queen c7, this is maybe white's only try. Knight e7, pawn takes. It looks kind of like suicide, uh, but uh, maybe there was nothing better. Uh, after pawn takes, bishop d6, we have check, and we're going to gather a lot of pawns quickly. King d2, queen takes pawn check. Qu King d1, queen f1 check. Cute. Oh, you do take here? Oh, OK. I've got, I've got queen takes d3 in the computer. OK, so you take here first, and if he goes back, now you can go to d3. Right. And then I go, yeah, I go to d3. Yeah, sure, awesome. And he has even fewer pawns on the board. Check. Um, and uh, yeah, just uh, totally lost. That controversial move, c5 to c4, um, is, is one of the key decisions that starts this. Uh, but also, I think white early giving up that light squared bishop, um, uh, you know, the chess board has light squares and dark squares, and you have to have pieces on the board who can impact both of them. Um, uh, if you don't, you've really given up um, uh, fighting for those squares. Um, so uh, yeah, that happened to white, and um, yeah, good job taking advantage. OK, so this game against Phil Paraplitsky, not to say that um, uh, black played um, to the best of his ability here, but this was another game I was pretty proud of. And um, after having looked at Julian's um, uh, positional ideas, um, I think this one uh, w would also be uh, fun to look at. Um, 
my opponent plays d6, and I have a fair amount of experience analyzing some of these lines with, with uh, National Master Charles Lawton. Um, he likes to play very aggressively. Um, would probably recommend um, knight c3, uh, followed by perhaps bishop g5, queen e2, castle queenside. Um, and having looked at some of those and recognizing that black does have uh, plenty of counterplay, I just opted for this more logical completing the development of my minor pieces. So knight f3, bishop g7, bishop c4. I had played this move against Josh Frank. Um, he's about 20, 2150, local player, um, and um, had gotten a good game. I had an advantage. It petered to a draw. But having recently played that game and having had some success with bishop c4, I was pretty comfortable um, going into this again. Um, castle, and now um, I'm not really going to think uh, too long. Um, I like king safety. Um, I like finishing the, d the development. So I, I'm, my, my two thoughts are bishop g5 and 0-0, zero, zero, um, in which order, not terribly important. Um, uh, first, <laughs> first I played queen e2 because I'm still sort of holding out hope that I can play one of these lines that Charles uh, Lawton has suggested to me. Um, if I'm putting my bishop on g5, there is a possibility I'm going to want to castle on the queen side. And even if I don't castle on the queen side, I can still quickly bring a rook to d1 if I've developed the dark squared bishop. Uh, so queen e2 was my attempt at a trick. Um, he played knight c6, and I dropped in bishop g5. Uh, one question is, um, can I right away play e5 on the next move? How's he going to stop that? Um, probably has to play h6, or in this case, he plays knight to d7. Now, I don't recommend moving pieces twice in the opening, and my opponent's about to embark on a kind of a, um, uh, an extensive knight maneuver that um, I think gives me a lead in development. Um, I play rook d1, uh, which I wanted to play anyway. Um, now I'm certain I'm castling on the king side. And if knight b6, I'm just going to play bishop b3. And all of my pieces are out, and I just don't think black is playing very well. I was surprised that, um, and uh, no knock against Phil, I don't know him very well, but uh, you know, usually 2200s uh, develop their pieces. Um, bishop to b3, uh, knight a5. So now we've moved the knight to f6, d7, b6, and the other knight to c6, a5. That's investing a lot in knights. I hope bishop pair is worth that kind of lead in development. Um, judging from, let's see, I looked at uh, the, uh, the, the recent, um, let's see. Uh, there was a game where um, Luke McShane uh, played Carlson, and uh, McShane had white, and um, played to give up the bishop pair for quick lead in development. That was played in the London Classic in 2010. And, um, you know, I think similarly, it's like, it's fine to give up your bishop if all of your pieces are out and you're ready to attack. And certainly that's the case for me. Meanwhile, black's going to have to figure out what to do with the light squared bishop. Um, and um, neither of his rooks is actually in the game yet either. So um, I castle h6. Bishop f4, c6. I can't imagine a, um, a worse move. Um, now the knight can't retreat from a5. Uh, so it's kind of stuck out of the game. h3, now I started thinking prophylactically. I said my development's finished, right? And my opponent, it, he's, not, he's not in zugzwang, but he's certainly not in a position to help himself. Anytime it's his move, he can only make his position worse, or at least that's the mentality that I had. So here, probably looking for a move, um, he played g5. Um, and now I'm getting pretty excited, because if my development is finished and his king side is opening up even more, um, this should be a way for me to take advantage in exciting style. So I played Ben Feingold's favorite move, bishop c1. Um, now that my rook is in from a1, um, I'd like the bishop as far away from the action as possible. Knight takes b3, a takes b3. I figured that would happen at some point. And now the very curious, queen d7. So we just looked at a game where positionally um, black was playing very well. And here we have a game where uh, positionally I think black is playing very surprisingly. 
he's not enterprising in getting his pieces out. Um, he's actually putting them um, in a kind of a congested position. He doesn't have any space. Um, meanwhile, if we look at the white position and we know all the pieces are in play, um, the question becomes, how can we activate even more? Um, the first thought that came to my mind was, I want to play pawn to f4. And I can't do that unless I get my knight out of the way. And there's no reasonable place to put the knight other than h2. So that's what I played. Um, now, he may play f5. I think that was one of his best options. Um, but he played this queen e6. And now, I guess, the idea behind queen d7 comes, um, comes in here. He might be wanting to put that queen over at g6 to help defend his king side. Looks a little bit late. f4 takes, and I played rook takes. Um, it's hard for me to explain why I did this. I think it was because I wanted to play rook h4. And I also was looking at my knight, now at h2, no longer really committed to the f3 square. I might be sneaking the knight into g4. And how many attackers can I get on the h6 pawn? I think more than he can get defenders. Um, so he plays queen g6. And I play knight g4. Better was the immediate rook h4 where even if he plays something like f5, takes, takes, now I can play knight g4. Um, and for some reason, as I had to calculate these variations, even though I lifted the rook with the idea of taking it to h4, I think I just got confused about move order and didn't realize how potent it was to play rook h4 straight away um, and instead put the knight in first. And now I'm going to have to move the knight before I can put the rook at h4. Um, well, fortunately, he helps me out. Pawn to h5. Now I have to move the knight. So I do. And now e5. And now I have to move the rook. So I'm actually getting an opportunity to fix the mistake that I had made with my plan. Julian. Let's see. Can, the question is, can he play bishop takes d4 with the idea that if I play rook takes, he plays e5, e5 forking the rooks? And it looks like he may be able to do that. Um, how would I have answered this? Do I have anything reasonable to do? I guess one, I don't know why this is the first thing that comes to mind, but if I play some, something odd looking like rook f5 with the idea that if he takes my rook, I play rook g5, um, that's pretty wild, but his king's very open. So let's just look at it really quick. If e takes d4, rook g5, queen takes g5, bishop takes, pawn takes knight, Queen takes here, I'm pretty sure he's getting mated. Yes, is there a better line? Yeah, instead of queen takes g5 after rook g5, can I just take queen knight on c3? You can straight away take the knight on c3. Like, I don't want to give a on c5. Agreed. What if I play queen takes h5? Yeah, I like pinning pieces and then, and then like taking advantage of the fact that they can't move. But, uh, but yeah, I don't know if this is a good idea. I mean, so he can play bishop takes f5. I can play e takes f5. And if he, uh, if he takes the pawn, now I can slide the other rook over to h4. Yeah, OK. I think at this point, Phil's probably in trouble. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, he definitely was looking for ways to activate the bishop. And he played that e5 move. And I captured, and he captured with bishop. Um, I wasn't really worried about that. Um, but I did immediately start thinking, how can I remove the bishop from e5? So OK, first let's put the rook on h4. And after a move like f5, my best idea was probably to play knight d3 and take his dark squared defender, the bishop on e5. Um, now my bishop springs into action. At some point, it's going to be able to go to h6. or I can just play rook takes h5, rook h6, followed by queen h5. 
Um, so the king is, is, is pretty open. Um, so this is the opposite of a positional masterpiece, I would say. This is a tactical uh, melee. Um, but it's also one that really is in favor of white. Um, bishop f4. Uh, now this idea, you know, not the best way to get rid of the bishop, right? I wanted to keep my dark squared attacking piece. So a lot of times when we're analyzing our own games, I think it's very useful to look at um, the mistakes that we make and, and how we think. Um, and I'd like, next time, next time I play, I'd like to be more cognizant of which pieces I need to keep on the board. Sometimes those are the decisions that determine whether you win, lose, or draw. Um, it's just understanding which pieces are good, and, the, and if the ones you know, that are bad aren't good, how to improve them. Um, so in this case, the bishop on c1 was fine. His bishop, I, I think I was, I was looking at a ghost threat. The reason I played bishop f4, anybody recognize from what... Uh, you know, what his bishop at e5 might be looking at. Um, maybe I was, I was thinking, well, gosh, he wants to play queen g3 um, and queen h2, but gosh, that queen can't go anywhere because I have a knight defending h1. Um, but I think just probably not wanting to calculate a lot of lines, that was what went through my head. Um, anyway, uh, the computer preferred knight d3. Certainly. I was just talking about wanting to take advantage of pinned pieces, pieces that can't move. And if I, if I allow the queen to come into g3, I think one of the things I was worried about was, well, gosh, then I can't move my f2 knight because the queen uh, really is threatening some things down there. Um, and also, I, I, it wasn't clear to me that the bishop wasn't going to be able to go to g3 and maybe my rook is trapped. Uh, but uh, that probably shouldn't have bothered me uh, too much. Knight d3 would have been good. Uh, where uh, we could have continued bishop e6, knight takes, pawn takes, and rook d6. And uh, although I was looking at ways of getting my rook into d6, I missed that the knight was going to take the bishop off the board. Uh, um, sometimes those kinds of things happen in, in calculation. So in any event, um, I played bishop f4, he played knight d7, takes, takes, and queen takes h5. So at this point it's okay for the queens to come off the board. They do. And here comes rook d6. Um, and um, I've just got a couple minutes left, so uh, we can probably wrap this up fairly uh, quickly. Um, the bishop on e6 is on pre. Uh, it either has to move or we slide in the a rook to defend it. Uh, but I've got two knights who are ready to occupy e4. Um, after this rook at a to e8 move, um, I, I was thinking about exchanging e takes f5, bishop takes f5, one of my knights to e4. Um, but I decided that if the bishop was going to stay at e6, maybe it's better not to take the pawn and to bring a knight to attack the bishop a second time. Uh, so he played knight g6, which does stop knight f4, doesn't stop knight d4. Um, and knight d4 is what I played. <laughs> Uh, bishop f7, and at this point, um, he actually resigned. Um, he, he played this move and, and realized um, that things aren't getting any better. Um, I think possibilities included uh, rook to g5 uh, followed by pawn takes pawn, um, or even an immediate pawn takes pawn. Um, the black king at g8 is really pretty, pretty toast. Uh, so anyway, that was one of, one of my favorite games at the time. Um, I suppose since then, um, I haven't had a chance to play enough rated games. But hopefully I can give you guys some more at some point in the future. Mm -hmm.